for this whole season, actually till June, my theme for my sermons all start with P. I don't know why, but they do. When I was a kid, I used to like to do that tongue twister. Peter Piper, Peter Piper, Pickle Peppers, Pickle Peppers, Peter Piper, Peter Piper, Pickle Peppers, Peter Piper, Peppers, where is Pickle Peppers, Peter Piper, Peter Piper, Peter Piper. And my last name starts with P. So you get a bunch of peas. Eat your peas. <laughs> We're going to eat our peas. So this one, I thought for January, for a new year, a good theme would be to look at promises. Promises we make, promises to make, and promises to keep. Do you promise? That's something we say to each other a lot. Do you promise? Will you really do this? Do you promise? Now, some folks said we, that, that we shouldn't even have that in our vocabulary, that people should mean what they say. And if they say they're going to do something, they should do it. We shouldn't have to promise. You know, you said it, do it. But there's something about making a promise that makes it a little bit more of a commitment. For example, my sweet husband Greg is kind enough to take my mama's recycling to the recycle place. She has, she puts it all out in a big can outside of her carport, and then he will get it and take it to the recycling place. She lets me know when it starts to get full. He's supposed to kind of go by and check it, but that doesn't always happen. So, you know, I might say, Greg, mama's recycling can is full. Will you go by and get it? And he'll say, yeah, I'll get it. And he usually does, but what if he gets really busy and things come up, okay? And you think, well, I'll go, to early, I'll go tomorrow morning and get it. And he would, you know. But what if he forgets again? And what if I say to him, Greg, when you get Mama's recycling? He said, yeah, and I say, do you promise? <laughs> do you promise you will? Now, I'm not saying this ever happened. You can imagine it or not. But things like this happen. And if he says yes, he's probably going to go by and get my mama's recycling. Because he promised. There's something about making a promise that makes us make that extra effort. Know that we're going to really be committed to making these things happen. As I thought about promises and what kind of promises I wanted to talk to you folks with, I read a lot on magazines, internet, and other things, books about promises, and I came across some promises that I thought were uh, maybe effective for you to use. You know, not all promises I read about I didn't think would be just what we might need to hear, but at least it felt, sounded good to me. These were promises that a guy, this, the, uh, this blogger, Mark Chernoff, came up with, and he calls it 12 Promises. Now, Mark, they, he and his wife both have a blog, and they, it's one of these self-help kinds of blogs that, you know, when you need a little extra affirmation, a little encouragement, and we all do, they're, it's a good blog to go to that he and his wife have. They also have a book, and since I'm using their, their things, I'll give them their book a plug, 1,000 Little Things Happy Successful People Do Differently. Disclaimer, I have not read that book, okay? <laughs> but I'm using their stuff, so I want, you know, I'll give them a little plug for their book. Now... Actually, I am going to share some of his promises with you that we might take, you might adopt as your own. I have to tell you, though, some of them I had to change a little bit or add or subtract something a little bit. You know, we can do that too. But these are the 12 promises that he shared that I think are meaningful and I would like to share with you this morning. One, I promise, and you can read this with me, I will not hold the past against myself. That is a very difficult one, isn't it? I will not hold the past against myself. We all have things in our past. We all have failures. We have pain. We have mistakes. Lots of stuff. And what this promise is that we'll not, that that past will not hold the past against myself. Well, actually, my past mistakes, my past pain, my past failures, my past difficulties, frustrations are helpful in some ways. I can learn from them. And we should learn from our mistakes, right? These are life's lessons. 
We should learn from them. Well, how I got to thinking about this a little bit, though, when I made this little picture, put these words on here. When I think of lessons, I guess being a teacher, I think of books. And so a way I kind of think about these past things is like I've gotten these things in these books, these lessons, these life lessons I've learned about my failures, my pain and stuff. Somebody else might use a different word. I'll say stuff, my problems, my setbacks, my mistakes. And what I will try, to, what I try to do though, what I want to try to do, is put them up on the shelf. They'll yeah, put them on the bookshelf. Now, every now and then I might need to get one down and review it a little bit. Oh, remember when you did this? And you know, I'm not saying I'm forgetting stuff, but I am not going to put them in a backpack and in suitcases and carry them around with me everywhere I go. Let them weigh me down. I will not hold the past against myself. Second promise. I promise, share this one with me. I will own my life and never deny responsibility for it. I will own my life and never deny responsibility for it. Me. And I found this sweet little picture like we used to see all the time. Look at that daddy looking down and says, who do you belong to? And the little girl says, you daddy. That's supposed to be a sweet little picture. But that's not how it should be. People don't own people, or they shouldn't. Now we have responsibility for them, we have responsibility for our children, we guide them, we give them direction, but we don't own them. Husbands don't own wives. Wives don't own husbands. Spouses don't own, own spouses. Teachers don't own students. So I just changed that picture. I know how to do I got. I, I can do a little internet stuff. <laughs> Who do you belong to? To myself, Daddy. To myself, Daddy. You own your own life, and you have to take responsibility for it. I promise. Now, when you all read these with me, you're not promising. You just help me read them, okay? So don't be afraid to read them. I promise. Read this with me. I will speak kindly and consciously to myself. We're always telling ourselves, oh, I messed up. Oh, I didn't remember that again. Oh, I forgot that again. Oh, I'm having these problems again. And we tell all this negative language to ourselves. Part of that's because it's been taught to us to do that. All this negative self-talk that we don't, we're not kind enough to ourselves. We should tell ourselves positive good things. And our children, we should teach them to do that for themselves. You remember this scene in the hell? You is kind, you is smart, you is important. You is smart, you is kind. You, you is important. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> that's so good. That's so good. Four. I promise I will listen to what my heart and soul is telling me. so noisy and busy. And these things we hold in our hand and look at every few seconds are problematic as well. You have to take the time to have some silence. Sitting on your front porch. There it goes. <laughs> <laughs> There's the example. <laughs> Thank you for providing that example, Bill. Sorry. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. You, you see, this the word listen contains the same letters as the word silent. 
Now, folks, if you have a hard time doing that and need a little help doing it, a little structure to do it, we invite you to come up here on Tuesdays and Friday mornings and sit with our meditation group. Wednesday afternoon. And now also, yes, Wednesday after those that had said, well, I would come, but I had to work then. Wednesday afternoon at 5.30. Wednesday afternoon at 5.30. It will give you an opportunity to leave your phone off back somewhere else and to sit in some silence and listen to your heart. Listen to your breathing. Listen to your soul. Number five. I promise I will live a life that feels right to me, not one that looks right to others. Mm -hmm. Spend too much time trying to have our lives look right to somebody else. And it's not really what our life should be. Oscar Wilde has a good quote about this. He says, be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. Be yourself. Number six. I promise I will let go of relationships that are obviously not meant to be continued. Now, that continues in italics. And the reason it's in italics is because, I, to be honest with you, I tell you, I added that word. I added it. What Mark had was our work of relationships that are obviously not meant to be. I got married when I was 17. Not to Greg. <laughs> to Fred Page, 17 years old. We were married for 30 years. Most of it happened happily. Thank goodness. A lot of difficult things came about. And in 1998, we divorced. Well, after I divorced, somebody said to me, well, that, you just married the wrong man the first time. That just wasn't meant, that wasn't meant to be your husband. And I said, that's not true. I married the right man when I was 17 for my 17-year-old self. Well, tell me 30 years of my life was a mistake. <laughs> It wasn't that that relationship wasn't meant to be, but it sure wasn't meant to be continued. And I had to figure that out, okay? And this is not just about spousal relationships, but, but others as well. Sometimes there are relationships that for whatever reason, we have to let go of. It says, one of the happiest moments ever is when you find the courage to let go of what you can't change. To let go of what you can't change. Just let it go. Now I'm very fortunate that I have a wonderful relationship with my ex-husband. So we still have a wonderful relationship, but that marriage wasn't meant to be continued. Number seven, I promise Help me. I will not let any situation permanently steal my smile. When I read that, and the first thing that came to my mind, I hate to tell y'all, you know how sometimes advertisements ruin things for you. My smile now, what I think of when I think of my smile is all those dental ads. <laughs> I got my smile back. Where's your smile? You know. My, your smile, your smile now has come to mean that your teeth are straight, or you, got, you don't have gaps, and that you got, and they're white. That's your smile. Get your smile back. So that messed up that for me. Messed it up. So I've changed it. Number seven, I change it. I promise, I will not let any situation permanently steal my joy. You're not gonna steal my joy permanently. You might come in and take a little of it away and make me sad for a while, but you're not going to get it permanently. <coughs> I'm not going to let any situation permanently steal my joy. How many of you are, are you Anne Lamont fans? You read her stuff. 
She says, joy is the best makeup. I get ready to go out. I might put a little bit on. I don't need much because joy is the best makeup. Joy. Number eight. I promise, help me, I will celebrate and appreciate the life I have. You know that far church mantle that we share here? He says, want what you have. Do what you can. Be who you are. But I, in order to promise that one, I had to add a couple of words. Whenever possible. I will celebrate and appreciate the life I have whenever possible. Because folks, there are some times in my life, in some situations, I, I can't celebrate. I can't appreciate right then. So I added whenever possible. I modified it. Okay, you can modify it too. Number nine. I promise, help me out, I will realize and use my power to make a difference. You have power. We all have power. Sometimes we need to put it together. We can't do it by ourselves. But we got some power. I know I do because I took some steroids for that coal I had. They gave me. I got some power now. But use your power for good. Use your power for good. Number 10. I promise I will dedicate myself to personal excellence. You see how fast that flew up there? The other just kind of floated up. That one flew up there. That's me. I'm a, I want. I, I'm, a, I'm a student, y'all. I got several degrees. And I love being a student. I, I have to get my A. You know, I got to be excellent. I got to. I got to study hard. I got. I, I, I got to do right. I got to excel, excel, and dedicate myself to trying to do the very best I can. Now, as I have gotten older, <laughs> at 66 years old. I have realized that my personal excellence in some things may not be as good as it used to be. But it's still my personal excellence for a 66-year-old, okay? And for instance, my personal excellence, if, I, if, if Eric wasn't here today and I had to play the hymns for you, I would practice and I would give you my, my personal excellence. Now, that, that wouldn't be Eric Stetson, you understand, but it would be my personal excellence. So, I'll dedicate myself to personal excellence. Number 11, I promise, help me, I will keep stretching myself beyond my previous level of comfort. We got yoga here now, y'all. We do. I'm going to start back taking it too. I couldn't have had company last this past week, but I'm, this coming week I'm going to go to yoga. I'm going to stretch myself. I could do it by myself at home too, of course, and you all can too. But you have to stretch your bodies out. You can't let them get all punched together. We have to stretch ourselves beyond our level of comfort a little bit. And not only our bodies, of course, but our minds. We have to stretch our minds beyond our level of comfort. Let me tell you what I did recently to stretch my mind. I read a speech by Newt Gingrich. He made a speech to the department, to the, 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 the uh, Heritage Foundation. Heritage Foundation. Was it Heritage Foundation? I was thinking it was the Defense Department. That maybe it's the same speech. It also made me wonder to, to, to the, uh, some kind of, um, uh, something related to defense. Anyway. He made a speech. I read the speech. Now, I don't agree with a lot of Newt Gingrich's values or his, uh, don't agree with a lot of his politics, but he is a historian. He knows a lot of stuff, y'all. And I learned some things. I learned some valuable things that helped me understand why some things in the world, based on some history things, are maybe like they are a little bit. I had to stretch myself to even start, but I stretched myself. I read the whole speech, and I learned some things. That's what we have to do. Our problem is, especially with social media, they have these algorithms. And once they see what you read, that's all that pops up is stuff like that. 
and we end up just feeding ourselves the same things. So you have to on your own stretch out. You have to look for things on your own to stretch yourself beyond your level of comfort. And then there's one more, number 12. I promise I will embrace the changes I know I need to make. Now, every one of you know you need to do some things differently. Unless you're not a human being. You've got some stuff, some changes you need to make. Might as well just throw your arms around it. Just say, I'm going to just embrace this change. I'm going to embrace this change. And I'm going to do these things. I've got a new start here, a new year. It's a good time to do it. You can do it anytime, of course. But I'm going to embrace this change. Now, we Unitarian Universalists know a lot about promises because we're kind of a people of the promise. We don't have a creed. We don't say this is what you've got to believe. But what we do say is that we covenant together. We promise certain things to one another. Our association has these seven principles. We say we affirm and support these things together. Somebody changed them and called them the seven promises of Unitarian Universalism, and they color-coded them according to the rainbow. I won't go through all those. But we have things that we share with each other. We have covenants we read in here to how we're going to treat each other. We have one back there on the wall somewhere that we've signed and we're going to take down again and sign it some more of how we're going to be with one another, how we're going to treat one another. We're people of the promise. We, we keep promises. That's what we have. Covenants with one another rather than this is what we all believe. We say this is how we're going to be in the world. This is how we're going to be with each other. So when you came in, hopefully you got a little envelope and it has a card in it and it has a pencil in it. So what I'd like for you to do, I'd like you to take, have, let's have a little time to think of what will you promise to this congregation? Think about it. Now, don't worry about, you're not going to sign it, folks, okay? So nobody's going to be the promise police and go and check, did you really do it, okay? We're going to put it in the offering plate later. We're not going to sign it, though. But think about what, what kind of thing do you think that you promise would you like to make to this congregation? And that would be between you and your better self, your good self that some call God, whatever your theology is. But what promise could you make to this congregation? I did this with the Brunswick congregation, and here are some of the things. I'll share some of the things some of them put. Show up and listen. Listen with curiosity. I will try to be more open and get to know people better. I promise to attend Sunday service unless sick or out of town. I promise I'm going to get to know a new person in the UUCG congregation. I promise to be more open and responsive in, in my interactions with members and friends. Some of them got real specific and said, I'm going to make coffee once a month. You know, but we're not asking you to fill out a, this is not a volunteer form, it's a deeper than that. What, you, you, you decide. If you're a visitor, it might be, I promise to visit again, you know? <laughs> but what can you promise this congregation? So on your index card, Eric's going to play a little bit. You're going to write one or more promises to our congregation. Do not sign your card. And then as a sign of your commitment, you're going to place your promise card in our offering plate during the offertory. Actually, what you can do is put it back in the envelope with the pencil because I'll probably reuse those envelopes and pencils. You know, that we try to recycle, reuse, and do that good stuff here. So you stick it back in there, and that's what you can put with your offering plate. So take a little time. Think about it. Eric's going to play a little for us, and we're going to make our promises. <laughs>
can wait and finish it up after the service and then put it in the offering plate. Um, but I want to close the sermon time with a poem that's attributed to Mark Twain. Now, as I read more about this, some people said, well, Mark Twain didn't really write it. It's one of those kind of things. I don't know who wrote it. Some people attribute it to Mark Twain, but I like it anyway. So I'm going to use it, even though I can't get it. And we're going to attribute it to Mark Twain, but I'm going to use it because I think this is a, some good promises that we can make to one another. And I'd like to invite you, please, to read this with me. I cannot promise you a life of sunshine. I cannot promise riches, wealth, or gold. I cannot promise you an easy pathway that leads away from change or growing old. But I can promise all my heart's devotion, a smile to chase away your tears of sorrow, a love that's ever true and ever growing, a hand to hold in yours through each tomorrow. I promise you that. I promise. Amen.